Today on the show, we're going to be talking about mental health and well-being with a focus on neuroscience and babies with our very special guest, Dr. Marty Glenn. Dr. Glenn is the clinical director at Rizio. Is that correct? And um, leads the power of relational leadership. Um, she's an award-winning and pioneering psychotherapist and educator. And Marty um, is the founding president of the Santa Barbara Graduate Institute. It's known for its graduate degrees in perinatal and prenatal psychology, somatic psychology, and clinical psychology. And she's also co-produced the documentary Trauma, Brain, and Relationship, Helping Children Heal. And she did that with Daniel Siegel and Bruce Perry. She's also appeared in several films, What Babies Want, What Babies Know, Reducing Infant Mortality, and Improving the Health of Babies. She's also the recent recipient of the Verney Lifetime Achievement Award in prenatal and perinatal psychology and health. Welcome to the show, Dr. Glenn. Thank you, Deborah. I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you. I'm so happy you're here, too. So, as usual, we're going to be talking a little bit about mental health stigma, but we're going to be also talking about mental health and neuroscience and babies. I know that's a very important hot topic um, coming out right now, and also how we can look at maybe prevention and awareness through neuroscience and babies. And we're talking about mental health stigma today because mental health is the largest public health priority. It's also the largest financial burden of any health issue in the world, and that was cited by the World Health Organization and World Economic Forum. Also, the Centers for Disease Control, in their report called Attitudes Towards Mental Illness, found that stigma and embarrassment are two of the top reasons why people with mental illness do not seek help or medication. And so issues um, about you know, surrounding mental health affect people from all walks of life. I like to just briefly talk about what is mental health, and I think this is a very simple way of describing it, but I think it starts with physiological balance, meaning our nervous system, our heart, our brain, our gut are feeling balanced, and it gives us an ability to organize and integrate those internal thoughts and feelings and balance that with what's going on externally with all the stimuli, people, places, sounds, and smells, etc. And that gives us a sense of inner peace. You know, because we're here talking about babies and neuroscience today, I just wanted to sprinkle in a little idea about that pre-existing mental health disorder, disorders may be exacerbated by pregnancy and childbirth. I'm actually pretty much sure they do because it's very stressful having a baby. <laughs> I have a 12-year-old and I know just, you know, creating the baby and, and delivering the baby is a major process. Um, and so we really need some diverse strategies to address mental health symptoms um, and that are intensified by, you know, the immense physical, psychological, and situational adjustments that occur during this perinatal period and, you know, postnatal period. Marty, how would you describe mental health? Very interesting question, uh, Deborah. For me, I think of, of mental health. I mean, we live here on the ocean, and you think about the waves that come and go, and it's just like our lives. Waves come and go, and if we're mentally healthy, we're able to kind of go with the flow. Um, we're, we all have times we're down. We all have times we're elated. Um, but if we have a capacity to kind of come back home, come back to shore, then we're probably pretty healthy. And I would also add to that is we all need someone we can reach out to when we're down. Mm -hmm. If you have a good friend, um, someone, someone in your family sometimes, maybe a coworker, anyone that you can reach out to to say, I'm having a down day today. That's an important part of mental health as well. Mm -hmm. That's so true. In fact, uh, we had um, Dr. Weininger on and she was talking about feeling like part of a tribe. Yes. And I think that connection to others is really key because especially when we have very stressful things going on or we have changes in our mental health or physical health, they're all intertwined, we become more isolated and sometimes we kind of shrink away from others and, and feel withdrawn. And so even like uh, Dr. You know, Marty saying um, that we should really connect with others and reach out. And so you're saying that's kind of like waves in the ocean where we kind of meet the waves and and then I like what you said about the shore as well. Kind of well, we're relational beings. 
as human beings, we have to have contact with other people. And when we're isolated, it's kind of a downhill slope sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways out of that is just find little ways that we can connect with others. Yeah. What little ways do you, like, what would you recommend for someone who maybe feels isolated or... You know, I there's many, many levels and layers. If you have a relative, a sister, a parent, a grandparent that you can reach out to, that's fantastic. Um, but everybody doesn't have that. Everybody doesn't have a best friend. Um, but just to try, uh, sometimes there's um, a minister or someone in an organization like AA or some of the 12-step programs are really wonderful places to find somebody to reach out. Another is... When This sounds silly, but when you go to the grocery store and someone holds the door open for you, take it in. Mm -hmm. Look in their eyes. Mm -hmm. Someone hands you a receipt for your groceries. I look them in the eye, and I feel better. It's wonderful. Just to make that one-second connection several times a day can make all the difference. I, yeah, I agree completely. In fact, I've been practicing just even if someone looks like they're not very happy, practicing or smiling at them and seeing if they'll change and I do notice there's a little shift and people feel a little better like oh somebody cares about me you know well I feel better when I do that and we both feel better yeah. it's true it's a yeah. mutual relationship I mean I also I know in Santa Barbara we have 211 which is a number I mean I haven't called it myself lately but I know that you can call that and I think it's available 24 hours a day so um there are some resources mm -hmm. um so we're exploring the relationship between mental health and neuroscience and babies and um, I wanted to just briefly go over mental health stigma because I really like to clarify that so people can get a good understanding about stigma um, because there's social stigma and self-stigma. And social stigma is when attitudes and discriminating behavior directed towards individuals with mental health problems as a result or as a result of the psychiatric label they may have been giving. So socially, that's why one reason I want to do the radio show is I think the media and how we relate with each other really impacts um, the ability to feel accepted, even if we have flaws, and we all do. Um, and then the other kind of stigma is self-stigma, which is when we internalize um, the perception of discrimination from others. And I think that is a huge one where we really feel different and like we're not part of this tribe. Um, and so that's why I think stigma, really, we have to work to eliminate that and, and be more accepting of each other. Um, in fact, this year, Time Magazine makes an annual special magazine. Last year, it was on mindfulness meditation, which I was very happy about. But this year, it's on mental health. And on the back of the cover, it's like a book. It says that every person in their life will have mental illness. I like to use the word mental health issues. So just know that we all are encountering this. I mean, and how you can maybe participate and look at it a little differently. Um, and also, stigma can significantly affect the feelings of shame and lead to poor treatment outcomes and also health problems. So we need to take care of our mental health by being able to discuss emotions and thoughts and feelings within ourselves. We are going to take just a momentary break and play um, a public service announcement about prioritizing South American forests. And then we're going to be back to talk much more with Dr. Marty Glenn. So stay tuned and we will return momentarily. Prioritize protecting South American forests. Every year, thousands of acres continue to be burned. There are impoverished countries there who need help. Oxygen production and species are necessities. Magnetic shield thinning puts this above saving oceans. This message is brought to you by EcopeaceVision.us. Hi, welcome back to the Dr. Deborah Show. Uh, we're live here at KCSB FM, Santa Barbara 91.9. And this is the Dr. Deborah Show, where we're talking about bringing peace and calm into your life. I'm a clinical psychologist with a specialty in neuropsychology. And um, I'm also a UCSB alumni. So I'm back at UCSB enjoying uh, being on the campus here and, and also creating compassionate conversations in our community. We're here talking about mental health and neuroscience and babies. <clears throat> and I'm very excited, <clears throat> excuse me, a little tickle, um, to announce our special guest, Dr. Marty Glenn. Dr. Marty Glenn is the clinical director at Rizzio Institute, and she leads the power of relational leadership. She's also an amazing winning and pioneering psychotherapist and educator. Uh, we, 
We also had the Santa Barbara Graduate Institute, which she's the founding president of. It's known for its degrees in prenatal and perinatal psychology, somatic psychology, and clinical psychology, which are really on the forefront, the wave of the future. Such a hot topic. And she's co-produced the documentary Trauma, Brain, and Relationship, Helping Children Heal with Daniel Siegel and Bruce Perry. She's also appeared in the films What Babies Want and What Babies Know and Reducing Infant Mortality and Improving the Health of Babies. She's also the recent recipient of the Verney Lifetime Achievement Award in Prenatal and Perinatal Psychology and Health. Welcome to the show, Dr. Glenn. Thank you, Deborah. So um, we're talking about mental health and neuroscience and babies, and um, there's been a lot of discoveries on this topic. Like I was saying earlier, it's a very hot topic. And... um, those studies have included areas from developmental psychology, cognitive neuroscience, um, and they kind of are synthesized into an integrated framework for understanding how the brain gives rise to our mental processes and directly shapes is shaped by our pers- interpersonal experiences. He, um, Daniel Siegel calls this interpersonal neurobiology. And, you know, really that's how we get our mirror neurons, which we really need by looking at each other and talking to each other and connecting with each other. And that's one of the issues going on, too, with with all of our devices. So just to keep that in mind. Um, but we, we wanted to talk about this so we can think of it more as an integrated view of how human development occurs within a social world in transaction with the functions of the brain. Um, Dr. Marty, how do you think mental health and neuroscience and babies intersect? Wow, that's a big question. A big how much question. time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Actually, um, it's, um, it is a very important question. And one of the things that we know is that we grow our brains from the very beginning. Um, we just like we grow our DNA, we grow the heart, we grow uh, the brain grows from the beginning, and everything grows from experience. What what we experience from our parents and those around us really creates literally the physiological um, brain that we that we experience that we, that we have. So if our mother is um, if our mother is calm and present and if we're wanted and the mother is supported, then we have an ideal chance to have, I want to say, the best brain and nervous system possible. Now, this is not about blaming mothers because we can't do that because I am one and we can't blame moms. And what yes. I know is that I was not able to be present and available for my own children when they were little, even though I did all the right things. Mm. I had natural childbirth, I breastfed, I made all my baby food, et cetera, et cetera. But because I hadn't (coughs) dealt with my own early issues, I was not able to be emotionally present. And as I've worked on that... Um, Going forward, I'm now, I have great relationships with my kids, they're grown, and we're able to heal that. So it's very, very important for us to give our families the support they need so they can support the babies. And I love your honesty. Thank you for being so genuine and honest and sincere, because that's a hard thing to say, to say... I did everything. I gave them the right food. I was up at night. I did everything the book said, but there was still something that didn't work. And so how can I reevaluate that? And also what I tell parents too is, I mean, like uh, Marty's saying is we can really pick up kind of where we left off developmentally, even if it's an adult and kind of go through that process and it can be very healing and connecting, right? And then you can kind of move on and have a different genetic viewpoint too for the legacy for those kids that you know your grand your grandkids right that's right <laughs> so they'll have that that gift so i think that um it's never too late and also you know now we know that the brain is not hardwired that we're constantly with neuroplasticity we're constantly creating new neural pathways pruning back other ones so it the more we kind of can focus on what we want to manifest um, and do that with thoughtfulness and intentionality i think we can really change so um, that's a beautiful gift. And, and like um, Dr. Glenn is saying, at the core of these processes is this fundamental mechanism of integrating 
And it comes from a variety of levels. So there's the interpersonal to the neurological. Um, I mean, also, I was trained in depth psychology. So, I mean, I even think of, you know, our dreams, our unconscious. Um, and so it's really healthy for us to be able to integrate these concepts and basic processes because they create secure attachments. And when we're attached to someone, it doesn't have to be a mother. It could be a father. It could be whoever your primary caregiver is in utero and after birth. Um, that is what really facilitates and creates psychological well-being. And I know a lot of people think, oh, you know, babies, they're just so cute. And, and oh, and they don't know how to talk, but they just don't have the language skills. But I actually think babies are smarter than we are. So if we can really turn to the babies, um, there's some really beautiful things that we can share. And I know my son is kind of, I think of him like my Buddha. So listen to your kids. They may have things that you can learn from them and, and we can learn from each other. Um, Marty, why do you think reducing mental health stigma is so essential? Well, I think you named it beautifully, uh, Deborah, that the, the fact that every single one of us has some kind of mental health issue at some time in our lives. Um, we need to accept that and just to know, oh, here's mine. You know, a mm -hmm. parent dies or you move to a new town or somebody loses their job. Things happen. Life happens. And we get depressed. I found myself very depressed after my mother died. And I didn't, I mean, I'm a therapist, but it took me a while to realize that I was very depressed. Well, that's something, yeah, you never exactly. Ever right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to know that our friends are going to de be depressed and maybe they're anxious. Maybe they're going to be using things like food or substances at times where they don't know what else to do. We all go through it. And if we can be a little kinder to ourselves and to each other, then we'll open that up. And also, I think just being aware is like, I know when my patients come in to see me and they say, can you fix me? I feel broken. I mean, I can't fix anyone, but I think, you know, if we can be more aware and like Dr. Glenn is saying, like waves in the ocean, meet those waves. And before the way I describe, I use that same analogy, but so that it doesn't become like a tsunami, you know, and, and can totally consume you or kind of like when you let the water out of the tub, you know, it creates this <laughs> vortex that sucks you in, you know, so you don't get sucked into that. And the more we can notice, and I do think we, we all have depression, and anxiety, and they really kind of go hand in hand. I mean, and anxiety really is a given because everything's in flux and changing. And, you know, we don't know when we're going to get ill next. We don't know, you know, what's going to happen in 30 seconds from now. So it's important also to be, you know, realistic and honest with ourselves and others. And I think that it's painful to do that. Um, and, you know, I think from the time we're children, we do notice the differences in others. And so we're taught to look at that world from the lens of our upbringing and the life experiences that shape us. And one of these ways is how we're wired, like a thermostat that regulates our, you know, our temperature. Um, Dr. Glenn, how, can you explain how you think babies and neuroscience work a bit so people can understand? I know you have a vast experience and knowledge base, and I was just thinking, I mean, I know it's probably going to be hard to cover <laughs> and encapsulate, but I mean, I would love to just hear, you know, your, your idea about how babies and neuroscience work a bit so people can understand the foundation or concepts as it may relate to them. Well, the one of the most exciting things um, has been the research of Stephen Porges when he talks about how the nervous system develops. And what we know is that the nervous system really sends messages to the brain. And we are relational beings. We need to connect with other people. And that's really how our brains develop. And if I could just tell a little process here that's so, so exciting when we think about it. When we're born, there is a little tiny nerve endings in the inner ear. And if our mom speaks to us in a very gentle tone, then those nerves begin to thicken, or they call it myelination. And they thicken and join. And so with that, we begin to recognize the human voice. We know what's okay, what's calm, what's not calm. As that happens, the little nerves around the eyes begin to develop. And we can recognize facial expressions. And 
Then the nerve, it's called the vagus nerve, it's the longest nerve in the body, comes down around the jaws and then goes around the heart. And if our parents are present and available and things are pretty calm, the nervous system around the heart thickens and develops. And if that happens, then the nerve keeps traveling down and it thickens around the belly and the organs and we can digest our food. So one of the quest first questions I had was, okay, so what happens for those of us who didn't have parents who were attuned or didn't know how? And I got to tell you, if your parents didn't have it, they can't give it to you. Now we can give it to ourselves now, but if they didn't have it. So what happens is if we don't have that calm and soothing voice and that attention, then we don't develop the capacity to hear the human voice in a normal, natural way. We overread or underread facial cues. Yeah. And we become anxious. I think it creates trauma. And we can't digest our food. So there are many ways now that we can grow the vagus nerve and can continue to, ve to develop the nervous system. Well, and the vagus, the vagal nerve, it's a vagal nerve. Okay. Yes. Is that also Vagus appropriate? nerve. Vagus right. nerve is actually the root of compassion, too, which exactly. is really a hot topic. Exactly. And it runs from our brainstem to our heart to our gut to our lungs. That's right. It's an it's a integral, natural, biological part of us. And I love how you're explaining that. So, I mean, even if we're physically present, right, if we're physically in the in the presence of our child remember it like uh dr glenn is saying the way you're looking at your child the tone of your voice and that's why it's so important even in utero to talk to your child because they learn the voice through that relationship through your movements through your voice and also really developmentally we need that to to feel connected to ourself i think and to to develop a sense of self um, and so I think, you know, we do need nutrition, we do need sleep, we need a home, we need, you know, love, but try to really pause and connect. And if you notice there's something stopping you from connecting with your child, think about what it is within you too. And sometimes that's very hard to face and say, maybe I'm having depression today. Maybe I'm anxious, but I don't want to give that to this baby. So you can kind of even almost talk to the baby without talking. You know, you can, you could literally say it in words or you could think it. And I think the babies do pick up on that. Um, but, and if we could help with those relationships, we could have more world peace because I think then we'd feel more at peace with ourselves. Um, I think, you know, if we can reduce the stigma about these topics and just feeling like, okay, everybody has something going on. How can we talk about this? And so that's why we're here today. Um, there was a University of California, Irvine study on how the mother's psychological state affects a developing fetus. And they found something very interesting, which just reinforces what Dr. Glenn is talking about. And what mattered to the babies was if the environment was consistent before and after birth. I thought that was really neat. That is that the babies who did the best were those who, were, who either had mothers who were healthy both before and after birth. And those whose mothers were depressed before birth stayed depressed afterwards. And they found that that's what slowed the baby's development was these changing conditions. It doesn't mean that because you have depression, your baby won't be healthy. But it is really actually important to notice that. And I think that's much more common. 75% of women get the baby blues, which is kind of a low-grade depression. Um, and I think it's 25% get full-blown postpartum depression. So, um, And that can really impact the baby-parent uh, relationship. Um, Dr. Glenn, what has your work with babies and neuroscience taught you about the attitudes held toward mental health? I know you travel around the world. You talk with a lot of people about babies and neuroscience. I was just wondering, like, when you interface with people, do, do people talk? I mean, I know you're talking about mental health, obviously, but do people talk about mental health stigma or how to break through the barrier of discussing these, these topics? Part of what's happening now, Deborah, that's very exciting is that a lot of pediatricians now are being trained in this. And there is a, there's a study called the ACEs study, Adverse Childhood Experiences, yeah. that um, pediatricians are now starting to ask about 
um, did you have these things happen in your childhood? And more physicians um, are asking. They haven't quite learned yet what to do with the answers, but that's okay. We're getting there. And um, to, to understand, wow, maybe your parents weren't able to be there for you. Or maybe you lost a parent. Maybe you had surgery. Maybe you were in the neonatal intensive care unit. Mm -hmm. um, whatever that separation was, children who were, have been adopted um, have lost. And so it's not so much what happened to us, but how have we been able to get some support mm -hmm. for that? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot, a lot of talk, a big movement now in helping people understand mental health at every level and d doing that in a way that doesn't create a stigma. That's just saying, instead of saying, what's wrong with you, just say, what happened to you? Right, and more listening and just trying to intervene and notice what is actually happening. And I'm very happy to hear that, that, you're, that they're, the pediatricians are getting trained. I know that the ACEs, um, for those of you that aren't aware of what that is, it's an assessment tool that's come out um, that looks for, I'm trying to remember, the, I just had the word, it just slipped out of my mind. But well, It's the adverse childhood adverse, experience. Adverse exactly. child, right. So any kind of like traumas or major stressors or like uh, Dr. Glenn's saying, and how those impact us. And really, we all have trauma. Um, and, you know, some of us can tolerate that better because maybe we got lucky the way we're, we're wired, I think. Well, I'd like to speak to that yeah. because along with the ACEs study, there are 10 questions and anybody can go to ACEs, A-C-E-S, um, ACEs2high.com and take the test. And along with that, you also can take a resiliency test. Hmm. Now, I had a very traumatic childhood and of the 10, I had about eight of them. My husband says I had all 10. I'm only <laughs> claiming eight. But I had a very high resiliency score. And resiliency is created when you have someone like a grandparent, you have a teacher, you have coaches, you have a minister, someone who saw you, mm -hmm. someone that you could go to when you felt down, or someone who would make sure you had enough food to eat. Those are things that help us become resilient. And most of us, many of us, have a higher resiliency score than we had trauma. And so that's a good thing to look at. For sure. I mean, I think that it is important, too, to have people in our lives that see us. Like you said, I think a lot of people feel invisible. And especially that, that does even start a childhood. You know, I mean, even though maybe a parent or a primary caregiver is present, uh, the baby really needs to feel like they're seen and heard, even, you know, at a very young age. In fact, the first three months of life, at least the research I've read, you can tell me if I'm incorrect, but um, really the baby is looking to the parent, and in their mind, they kind of feel like they, they're controlling the parent. So when the parent or the primary caregiver doesn't respond, they call that psychic annihilation, and it's like the worst thing for a baby because they just feel like they're not being seen, they're not being heard, they're not being listened to, and it's catastrophic, actually, for the baby. So, um, and I think I, it's beautiful that, like you're sharing, uh, we can d discuss, you know, traumas we've had if they're severe, and we can still overcome them and have healing from them by getting support from a coach or a pastor or a rabbi or somebody in your life, a teacher, who supports you and cares about you and, and sees, you know, that you do have something to contribute. And this is where psychotherapy comes in. Excellent psychotherapy. So. And I think, you know, with psychotherapy, I'm a complete believer in it. I always recommend to people, find someone who really understands you, you know, that, that is a good fit for you. And, you know, most therapists will let you go talk to, you know, several people and make sure they understand your situation. Mm -hmm. Um how do you think that, you know, the field of babies and neuroscience um, gives support or could help a person through a mental health crisis, like by having this information and just having a deeper understanding about babies and neuroscience? One of the things that we know is that to make sense of our lives, the researchers call it creating a coherent narrative. If I can make sense of what happened to me, then I can put it behind me. And I can know, oh, right, the truth is I am who I am today because of what happened to me, all the good, the bad, and the ugly. 
And I'm, I don't want to wish that on anybody else. And I know it just is, it, it is what it is. And so by just making sense of it, and I often have people take a big piece of paper, draw a line down the center, and we do a timeline. Okay, I was born here, I was raised here, mm-hmm. I moved at this point, oh, I you know, I broke my knee at that point, whatever. Yeah. All the things that happened in our lives, and then we begin to make sense of it and go, oh, right. And then we put it away. It's there. And even when bad things happen, it can become not a gaping wound, but like a scar. Oh, right, I cut my hand there. I remember that. I had a few stitches. And we go on. It doesn't prevent me from having great relationships now and doing the life that I need to do. Is there how, so you are saying you personally have used these concepts and ideas, one, to help heal yourself and also to help others heal, um, you know, through these different kind of crises do you, having had all that trauma and that upbringing, I mean, what do you tell yourself to kind of navigate? I mean, I know you've probably had a lot of therapy yourself, and obviously you've done a lot of research. I was just curious because I know, I think that would be helpful for our listeners. I think people kind of understand the information. It's like the idea of being present and physically there with your baby. But there's this other depth to what you're talking about. Is there an internal dialogue that you have, like, that you've learned through these different maybe mentors or healing people that you've interfaced with that has helped you have a new tape recorder in your mind? Well, I would say that it's a process. Um, It gets better all the time. And one of the things that neuroscience talks about is a window of tolerance or a window of presence, my capacity to be with myself and others. And as I've been able to to understand what happened to me. I don't blame, you know, I know that my stepfather who abused me was abused himself. That doesn't make it okay. And I can sort of have compassion for him that that's what happened and it just is what is. And so I'm able to put it behind me. Um, As I'm able to do that, as I feel heard and understood by other people, I've, I've done many, many different processes and practices, and what I know is it's not just me telling myself something, although that's very helpful. It's about experience. What all the branches of science are telling us is that we need three things to heal. Number one is I have to have an experience of safety. That's not just, okay, I'm safe. I know nobody's going to come and get me. I'm safe. Number two is I have to be able to tell my story to someone who will listen. So it's telling that in the presence of a caring other. If we have those three things, we can heal anything. Mm, Yeah, so it's simple and it doesn't have to be complex. That's why it's important to have friends, you know, and a network of people. If you can build that, that up, I find when I have a down day, I reach out and call a friend up or, uh, you know, make sure to, to connect up with someone. Um, and I think, you know, the, that California adults with mental health issues really, I mean, we need to seek more treatment. I mean, because only 17% report they didn't get it, but I think that's actually like an inaccurate number. I think we need more <laughs> programs and more people just, I, therapy's become more of an acceptable mode of, you know, people think it's kind of cool in a way. And I'm glad because it's a great place to thresh through and digest some of those uh, things that have happened to us in our life. So um, I'd encourage Absolutely. you to Absolutely, and sometimes it. people think of therapy, oh, I can't afford that, and yet there are a number, here, right here in Santa Barbara, a number of clinics where people can go for very little or no cost. That's true. There's Family Service Agency, there's the Community Counseling mm-hmm. Center, New mm-hmm. Beginnings. They're all sliding scale, I mm-hmm. believe. Mm-hmm. So. And, you know, really you can have an opportunity mm-hmm. to, to experience that. Um, and a lot of times insurance will pay for part of things. So That's true. Yeah, yeah if you get a statement. Don't let that stop you. And, you know, I mean, I myself have had over 20 years of therapy. I mean, I went as a kid and then and for my training <laughs> I went. And I actually really have enjoyed the therapy because it really taught me, uh, like Dr. Glenn saying, how to love myself, how to accept myself. It doesn't mean that my life was perfect by any means, but it means that maybe I have a new way of experiencing it, like she's saying. And I think experiencing something, you know, it really changes it, it, our perspective. Um, 
So I think we're going to take a little break and talk a little more about mental health prevention and awareness through babies and neuroscience. I'm going to play just a quick um, public service announcement on foods, not, not bombs, is what the PSA is called. Are you interested in a volunteer opportunity that helps feed the hungry in your local area? Isla Vista-based nonprofit organization, Food Not Bombs, is looking for extra help. Food Not Bombs produces vegan meals every Sunday and serves them to the local community. Volunteers can help with meal prep at 2.30 p.m. to prepare for serving at 5 p.m. No experience is necessary. Meal prep takes place at the Merton Ivy Housing Co-op at 777 Camino Pescadero, and serving takes place at Little Acorn Park. More information can be found on the Food Not Bombs Isla Vista Facebook page. Hi, and welcome back to the Dr. Deborah Show. This is the show where we talk about bringing peace and calm into your life. And we're live here at KCSB FM Santa Barbara 91.9. And I'm a clinical psychologist. I specialize in neuropsychology. And I'm also a UCSB alumni, and I live in Santa Barbara, so I'm always happy to be back at UCSB um, doing the show with our wonderful guest, Dr. Glenn. And we're here talking about mental health and babies and neuroscience. I'm very excited again to announce our special guests in case you're just jumping into the show, Dr. Marty Glenn. And Dr. Glenn is the clinical director at Rizio Institute and leads the power of relational leadership. She's also an award-winning and pioneering psychotherapist and educator and the founding president of the wonderful Santa Barbara Graduate Institute. They're known for their graduate degrees in prenatal and perinatal psychology, somatic psychology, which are pretty much the waves of the future, and clinical psychology. And she's co-produced the documentary Trauma, Brain, and Relationship, Helping Children Heal with Daniel Siegel, Siegel and Bruce Perry. She's also appeared in the fabulous films What Babies Want, What Babies Know. It's a great movie. Reducing Infant Mortality and Improving the Health of Babies. She's the recent recipient of the Verney Lifetime Achievement Award in Prenatal and Perinatal Psychology and Health. So welcome to the show again, Dr. Glenn. Thank you, Dr. Deborah. And um, Dr. Glenn is here. She just has such a wealth of, of information on babies and neuroscience. I just, you know, we're, it's hard to pack it all in here. But we're talking about some of the ways that mental health impacts our community, both locally and globally. Um, and trying to imagine a world where each person has the opportunity towards self-peace and through this ability to overcome mental health barriers and obstacles um, and, you know, to be able to maybe reach treatment. Um, Dr. Glenn, have you heard of any campaigns or organizations in the baby and neuroscience field that work specifically toward reducing mental health stigma? And that's an unusual question. That's, yeah. Um, I think there are a lot of organizations out there. Um, certainly the, um, they're at the, at the national level. A lot is being done at universities. There are many, many uh, departments that are looking at, um, and we talked earlier about the adverse childhood experiences. Um, many organizations locally are also trying to, for example, have better birth practices. Mm -hmm. We know so much more now. So hospitals are getting in on the act of looking at how can we support babies and families to have a better birth. Mm -hmm. and have a better start. And certainly pediatricians are trying to support our efforts in that regard as well. I actually did, when I went online, just getting ready for my show, um, and I did a little research on that idea of campaigns, I did find, actually, there are some new, just in the last six months, uh, there was one in Montana um, that I saw where they're, they're really implementing that with pediatricians and hospitals and kind of creating this this flow um, so that there's not just the baby leaves the hospital <laughs> and then it stops, um, which I really, really am excited about. It's called the Perinatal Behavioral Health Initiative. Yes. And it's where they connect prenatal care providers, behavioral health providers, and also a care coordinator that creates a clinical team. It's a very new, innovative approach. But also the Department of Public Health and Human Services has awarded a $3.2 million grant toward health resources and services 
um, in the hopes to support at least one practice in each community with hospitals that deliver babies. So I think nationally, for sure, there is an awareness well, and a movement. Well, right here in Santa Barbara, the Bauer Foundation has funded um, some programs that make visits, for example, to new moms in the home right here in Santa Barbara. Yeah. So we're right here at home. Um, different agencies are becoming more and more aware and uh, supporting families. The Santa Barbara Birth Center also. Is the Bauer Foundation, I'm not familiar with that, and I'd love to know more about that. Is that um, something that, like, if there was a new mom um, or dad, um, primary caregiver, is there a way that they could connect up with the Bauer Foundation? Well, the Bauer Foundation actually supports other organizations and gives grants so that they are the ones who... Um, who are are providing the services okay. like through cottage hospital for example nice yeah yeah I, I always thought it'd be great if we could have more of those kind of resources um and i did have someone from the birth center when i had my son and, and it was amazing uh, laurel phillips yes she's now a I midwife she was a doula yes. then yes. and she was my doula and my husband said why do we need to have a doula but actually it changed my whole birth experience because she she was with me for several days it's true and i think that also what was great was <clears throat> I mean, I did have to pay her, but she came afterward and really just checked on me and made sure that, you know, everything was going smoothly. Um, that's that continuity of care that you're talking about from pre-delivery and pregnancy through the birth process. And then after we get home, often after a mom gets home, there's this letdown because they're home and now what do they do? And they're so isolated. new and different and they're isolated. It's true. It's such an isolating experience being a mom. And actually I had Jane Honickman on a couple of weeks ago and, and it's so neat hearing your perspective and hers because they're very similar but they're very different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think they're all important. Um, just to think about how we support mothers and women um, because having a baby is a major, major uh obstacle in some ways. In fact, when I was going through the research about babies and neuroscience, just to refresh myself, um, maternal uh, mortality came up. And so, you know, mothers do die during giving birth. It's a, it can be a very traumatic experience. And if the baby survives or, you know, the relatives. So it, it really is a, a very intense time for uh, mothers Certainly. Um, to have a baby. And I mean, I think we could maybe put more of this into our lives um, to create more mental health. These early daily interactions in a child's life that are frequent and positive, they're just so crucial to, to have optimal human development. Um, and addressing mental health really begins before birth. So throughout the prenatal period and into the first year of life, a child's brain and body are really developing very rapidly. In fact, there's something called neuronal bursts where we get these huge bursts of millions of neurons and it really only happens at, at when we're babies and then in, and in teenagers although I was talking to a neuroscientist here at UCSB maybe I can have him on the show <clears throat> and he was explained to me that actually even as we were older we're really we, we are really having more neuronal bursts than <clears throat> we realize yes our brains don't ever stop growing we are always 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 growing and it takes <laughs> It takes about 62 days to grow new neurons. And so, and those new neuronal connections can happen with experiences of calm and connection at any age. It's so true. And I think, you know, people for a long time thought, oh, you know, I'm, I'm past a certain age, so no. I can't change it. But you can change it. In fact, I mean, people are so excited about neuroplasticity. <clears throat> and I'll be in a conversation. I'll say, well, you're, you're changing your brain right now as we're talking. So that's correct. Um, Every moment we're, we're recalibrating and changing and shifting. Um, and so every moment really is an opportunity every second to change maybe our brain architecture and our future functioning. <clears throat> I don't know if people realize, I mean, that our personality gets developed 75% of it by the time we're three. So in the first two years of life, unless, unless that number's changed, 50% um, of our personality is developed. And then the third year... 25 more percent and then the rest of our life another 25 percent so those first three years are very crucial years and the baby is really taking that in 
So what I'd like to say about that, and we, and we talk about personality, um, but a lot of the neuroscientists like to talk about a, oh, it's called um, a program, a mental model, it's a set of beliefs, a paradigm, whatever you want to call it. Because of our experiences, or in relation to our experiences, um, we begin to believe things about ourselves and about the world. If we are responded to, if we are if our, our caregivers are present and nurturing and caring, then we're able to calm our nervous system and we're able to think, oh, I'm okay, I belong here. However, in many situations, that's not the case. We have parents who are not present, they're anxious, they're depressed, where again, we're not blaming them, but what happens is the shame begins to come and we don't develop in a way that's healthy. And so what happens is we develop a program that says, I'm not enough. Mm-hmm. And most of us have some version of, I'm not enough. I'm not pretty <coughs> enough. I'm not rich enough. I'm not, um, I'm not smart enough, whatever it is. And that's our personality affects who we are and how we relate to others. And what we know is all of that can change with experiences of safety and having experiences of oh i can do that huh not just thinking every day and every way i'm getting better and better i mean that's a start but we need to have those experiences and as we do we change the program which changes part of the personality and lets us be more relational more creative and more satisfied in our lives Right. And I mean, in therapy, we call that the corrective emotional experience. So yes. You get to experience something in a new way with a new person and realize maybe it doesn't have to be the way that, that it, it always has been. Um, so, you know, experiencing it, it can change your, your wiring. I think, I guess, what I was thinking of is how just we overlook the idea of personality development. And I know from a pathology level of how we develop depression or other mental health issues there is a path that's where the word pathology really comes from and they you know i think it comes from that time period but like dr glenn is saying just remember you can change that and you can all alter that it doesn't mean it's like futile (laughs) and there's nothing you can do which is really an amazing opportunity you know you can think of it like an adventure and you are speaking to how important it is for us to support families to support moms and dads and extended family to be there with the child. And you sort of alluded to this in the beginning, Deborah, but uh, screen time. Mm-hmm. I mean, I see so many. It's so easy. It's so addictive um, to pull out your phone when a mom is nursing the baby or when they're walking down the street or whatever they're doing. And so they're not having, my son calls it eye time. Yes. They're not having that real connective time with the kids or they're traveling and instead of talking to the kids they give the kid an ipad to keep them busy so that they can go on and do their lives and do their phone but what happens with that is that the child learns then to to regulate their own nervous system which is not always positive we need to Mm co-regulate our nervous system we need to be able to calm and soothe with another person we need to be able to be seen and heard and when mom and dad are on their phone i don't get that as a baby and they really that's one of the most painful things actually a baby can have i mean the example i give to to people in my practice and my friends too Mm -hmm. is if i turn to someone and i say i love you if I turn sideways and say I love you, and if I turn with my back and I say I love you, which one feels better? I mean, we know instantly, right? Just as a, you know, it feels good to like I just did that to Doctor Glenn. It's just that you know I looked at her and I was we, now we're both smiling. You know, I mean, there's an engagement that happens, and it's very it makes your heart feel happy, makes your gut feel calm, and and also we're recalibrating, and that's kind of what I did all my research on, which is they call it dynamic regulation kind of how we find this homeostasis between all these things happening all day and 
I do think it is really healthy to have this kind of dialogue with yourself um, of what do I need? How do I want to be talked to? How do I want to be treated? And also then when we get into those predicaments, we can be more aware of that and say, oh, that felt really nice. That person really understood me or, oh, that really hurt me. And that hurt me because I have some issues maybe around that. And just to learn how you operate, how you run. Um, did, I know in, uh, in your practice, you probably help people with that process, right? Exactly. One of the things that we can do that that is um, that everybody can do is we can journal. We can write about what we're feeling. And then hopefully that will help us to share that with someone else. But everybody can pull out a piece of paper and just write. Write and write and write. Whatever it is you're feeling, you're thinking, um, write about it and get it out there. Yeah, and even, I mean, just doing something artistic, I think, or yes. getting in. I also am a big believer in nature because I feel like nature can't hurt you. So if you go sit by a tree or by the ocean or even just in the sun or or yes. not sun, in yes. the wind, um, and just notice this, your senses and connecting to the earth. Um, I think can be very healing. I know we were talking a little bit about prevention awareness, and, and I think that really is the key because now we do have a lot of the information about how these things, these different operations happen and how when they don't happen, you know, the outcomes can be um, unhealthy for the person and actually can become catastrophic. Um, so we do need more programs to be developed to identify and manage these mental health screenings with this increased awareness and communication. And then, you know, I think we could have more self-acceptance and acceptance of others and health. I always wanted to do this kind of program at the hospital where, you know, we teach, maybe we give out a little booklet or something. <laughs> and because I know it's hard to reach every single new parent. Um, just to talk about the stress of being a mom and and really that transition from leaving the hospital or wherever you have your baby to, like Dr. Glenn saying, coming home. And then all of a sudden you're there with this baby and you really don't know what you're doing and you're by yourself. Right. And Santa Barbara is very fortunate to have some um, wonderful programs and there are meetup type groups for, for young parents. I highly recommend that new parents get with other new parents. And that's very easy to do here in Santa Barbara. Um, through adult education, through a number of other agencies that they don't cost anything. You just meet up and those families stay together for life. It's very exciting. Yeah, I still see some of the people from my PEP group, which is PEP, fun. That's right. There's PEP, there's Mama Toto if you're interested in like attachment parenting, which is more if you're going to sleep with your baby and do long-term breastfeeding those. But also it is along the lines of what we're talking about. Um, is this attachment and how babies get attached to their primary caregivers. And we are very fortunate. I mean, I know someone came also to help with breastfeeding, um, which was which was fabulous. I think I still feel that the actual delivery of the baby, I have a friend that's an OBGYN nurse. I'm actually going to hopefully have her on the show um, because we're trying to create actually maybe a panel to have a discussion about this and get kind of everybody on board so that it's not just the nurses or just you know, the people coming in the home, but also, you know, the, the OBGYN nurse uh, doctors are also an important piece of this because they're treating the, the woman as she's going through her pregnancy. Well, Cottage Hospital is very aware of this and they are doing some wonderful things now to, um, to support parents. Yeah, I know. I just feel like it's such a crucial, still like a, a, a very crucial piece. Um, but, you know, we can work together to keep you know, creating this supportive environment and empowering and caring for the individual. And I know I had an amazing birth at Cottage, so I'm not complaining really about Cottage. I'm just thinking more of the mothers and just the stress. And I know because, I mean, I in my practice, I'm sure you did too, you know, I do get calls from people who have mm -hmm. postpartum depression. And it's interesting. Usually the referral comes from their primary care doctor. It does not come from the hospital saying, here's a list no. of people that no. you have as resources. And that's kind of, I guess, what I'm talking about. It's like a resource yes. guide, maybe. I know I found my um, little, it's kind of random, but I found this little thing from when I was born. And it was a like little pamphlet. And it was so cute. It talks about, here's what, what to expect. I was thinking it'd be cool to make another one of those. Here's what to expect with feeding, with changing diapers, crying, 
um, being up at night and here's what you can look forward to except you know expect in the next phase and I think that even though it wasn't a lot I mean it just is an, another idea mm-hmm. um, because I, I just hope that we can support mothers I'm gonna say new families need all the support they can get and we do have some great resources here so it's true and I think you know ways we can work together are volunteering checking in with ourselves learning about other cultures getting accurate information from accurate, reliable sources, not random scientific studies. And this can lead to an understanding and including and a caring. Could you imagine a world where we can share our feelings and thoughts more freely, where we can move toward health for all human beings? And there is a lot of work to be done because only supposedly 60% of the people needing mental health treatment receive it, although I think that number is not accurate. I think that most people need mental health treatment to some degree at some point in their lives and and they don't know if they can afford it or where to go so if we can each do our part toward ending these kind of negative perceptions about mental health and raise awareness we can live in a more loving safe and accepting world i want to thank my very special guest dr marty glenn for coming in today and sharing her wisdom did you have any final words of wisdom for our listeners that you'd like to to leave them with but just that it's possible. Change is possible. It is never too late. Um, I, we always say it's never too late to have a happy childhood. Um, it's never too late to go back and get now what you didn't get then. And it's never too late to give to our children what we may not have been able to give them when they were younger. So just keep trying and keep reaching out and um, keep learning to love yourself. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's such a great, you've kind of covered all the different areas. We it, And it is, it's like a collaborative effort. I like what the Dalai Lama says, that we're all breathing in the same air. We're all here together, you know, working together. And I'm just hoping Santa Barbara can really uh, maximize on all of our wonderful people we have here. We have a lot of great leaders like Dr. Glenn that can give good information and she's interfacing with lots of people globally. So she's a great resource. Do you have a website, Dr. Glenn, that if people want to find out more information, they can? Rizio.com. R-Y-Z-I-O.com. Great. So if you have other questions, you can contact her. And also, if you have questions for me, you can write to me on my Facebook page. It's called The Dr. Deborah Show. And I also just wanted to give a shout out to HopeNet of Carpentry. HopeNet of Carpentry is a group of concerned citizens who provide education and resources to prevent suicide. And our mission is to improve the mental wellness of our residents and to lessen the number of attempted and completed suicides in our community through information, support, training, and advocacy. So we hope to create a stronger safety net. Um, and HopeNet of Carpinteria is working hard for you. Um, if you know someone that needs help, you could call, and, and it's related to suicide, you can call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Their number is 1-800-273-8255 or Santa Barbara Access at 1-888-868-1649. And join us next week. We will actually be having um, a really amazing guest. She's from India, and her name is Supriya Vani. She's interviewed every woman Nobel Peace Prize uh, winner, and she's wrote a book about it. So we'll get to hear about her ideas and, and, and a different perspective from what we are hearing today. And thank you again, Dr. Dr. Glenn, for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Deborah. It's been my pleasure.